All right, welcome to this next video in my series, my ongoing series, addressing John Perry from the Stated Clearly YouTube channel. This has been a series addressing his arguments for endogenous retroviruses as apparent evidence for common descent and evolution. Now, specifically this video, this is part three, and this is going to explain what evolutionists need to know about the origin of retroviruses. Or in other words, in the form of a question, what is the true origin of retroviruses? And so this is going to be an important video, but I do encourage those who have not yet seen part one and two of my response to Stated Clearly's uh, video here titled, Did God Put Endogenous Retroviruses in our genome or endogenous retrovirus DNA in our genome. So do check out part one and two as they were thorough and comprehensive in engaging roughly the first 11 or 12 minutes of his video. Now I've written a book <clears throat> on the topic, the endogenous retrovirus handbook, dismantling the best evidence of common descent. So for those who want a comprehensive dismantling or counter to shared endogenous retroviral sequences in the biological world, then I do recommend uh, picking up a copy of this book as it is very thorough and it'll give you a detailed uh, and important counter to what many in the evolutionary community refer to as the best evidence for evolution. And so with that, let's get right into stated clearly his video and continuing our response. And so I will screen share here and I am particularly excited for this one as it is a video that is going to address an argument or a series of arguments <clears throat> put forth by John Perry here and many other militant critics of common descent. And it will address some of the arguments or challenges that they believe us as creationists simply don't have an answer to. And so let's get right into it. I am going to go on mute and we're going to play a little bit of his video. Little scars on the ends there. So that question that was asked, could it be that the things we call endogenous retroviruses are actually just parts of our DNA that God put there at the moment of creation? Well, Again, I'm not going to tell you whether or not you should believe that God exists. You know, there I've heard people say that God is do, is controlling all things. He's holding the universe together or whatever. So I, I suppose that every time a virus inserts its genome into a, a host, that was God doing that. So I'm not going to tell you whether or not this tells us anything about the existence of God, but it does tell us that that these uh, these insertions did not happen at the moment of creation. Wrong, John. The question, as I've asked throughout this series, is are these really the ancient remnants of past viral infections or are they created units of DNA function? Which ones are created units of DNA function if they are? And which ones are the true result of infection and subsequent endogenization? And so I've gone over the many reasons in part one and two that we are looking at created units of DNA function with a common design explanation. And John Perry, I have not seen him address these points in any of his previous videos. And so he's, of course, free to respond. And so firstly, these uh, shared endogenous retroviral-like sequences have amazing functions in determining cell types. They act in viral mimicry and they act in as a uh, in cell stress responses. They fight in the immune system. They are these front-loaded antiviral programs and DNA units that can fight off invading viruses. And many of these operational roles require their sequence similarity to exogenous retroviruses. Okay. 
And the majority of your so-called ERVs do not comprise the full ERV. We've got LTR, LTR, that, that stands for long terminal repeat, gag, pole, and ENV, ENV being the envelope protein of the viral-like DNA, okay? And so most so-called ERV and ERV-like sequences don't have every component, okay? What we find are mostly what's called solo LTRs, long terminal repeats, okay? And it turns, it turns out that these solo LTRs, these long terminal repeats, they serve as what? As binding sites for initiating or enhancing gene expression, okay? Gene expression being the process by which a gene is turned on to produce an RNA or a protein, right? You've got DNA to RNA to protein, this process of protein synthesis, DNA transcribed in RNA translated into a protein. And so these are important functional roles for biological organisms. And so the thousands of solo LTRs simply represent functional stretches of DNA. It is the evolutionists like John Perry that assume because their basic presupposition is that evolution is true, they assume that these solo LTRs are just degenerated versions of once full ERVs that comprise all of the uh, components and sequences of an ERV. And again, that is just simply an assumption, okay? These ERVs can act as promoters, enhancers, or even transcription start sites for again, gene expression. And these proteins that are encoded by the ERV sequences can actually amplify immune system responses through the binding of very specific receptors. There is function after function going on with these ERV and ERV-like sequences. Every single component of your full ERV, GAG, pole, ENV, LTR on either side, are absolutely necessary for these operational roles carried out by these ERV units, okay? The envelope proteins, for example, the ENV component of these ERVs, they also function in blocking these harmful viruses, these retroviruses, exogenous retroviruses, okay, that occurs from outside like HIV. There's many harmful viruses that can occur from outside, horizontal transmission, okay, rather than vertical transmission transmission so that the ENV components the envelope proteins of these ERVs actually act to block these harmful viruses from entering the system from entering the cell and causing some damage okay and so i've discussed this i've covered this in great detail in my first previous two videos i'm just pointing out the fact that john sounds a little too overconfident here he's employing some rhetoric some rhetorical tactics, but it isn't going to work. The question is, yes, God could have, as a matter of fact, he did suggest the evidence, <laughs> front load the genomes of living organisms with these functional units of DNA, okay? And that goes for many of the so-called pieces of junk DNA or evolutionary leftovers that militant critics of biblical creation like to point to, like pseudogenes. We understand that they're necessary to sustain healthy life processes, ALU sequences, and many of these non-coding regions of the genomes of living organisms, and then these various classes of retrotransposons. Very important functional roles, okay? And so John, if he wants to argue against design and say that this is not due to design, then he's going to have to show us how these amazingly designed DNA units can evolve or acquire these amazing functions, okay? Because one of the functions is involved in embryological development and in the placenta, which is a very important, it's an essential biological structure for the development of a human being. And this developmental process could not take place, would not take place in mammals if it were not for ERV sequences, okay? The placenta allows for continual circulation between mother and baby. That goes for nutrients, for gases, 
and also certain waste products. They're all circulated from mother to baby with the placenta based on the structure and design of the placenta. And this is all made possible because of ERV. So show me, John, if you're going to argue against design and assert this in this video, in this section, with no evidence, I want to see how a non-functional ERV, an ERV that doesn't function in embryological development, how can it acquire a novel function to where without it, we would not survive? Because in the conventional literature, they are saying that if it were not for ERV sequences and ERV-like sequences, mammals would not exist. I think John likes to exist. I like to exist. And so he needs to explain that. Okay, let's continue here. These things were put there by an integrase molecule. And integrase molecules are things that retroviruses have. So endogenous retroviruses definitely were not there since the beginning. For any endogenous retrovirus that you... That's an assertion. There's many types of retrotransposons that have the function of retrotransposition where they can move in the genome, okay? They can do this through copy and paste means, cut and paste means. And in order to do so, they require the reverse transcriptase for reverse transcription because we know retroviruses can reverse the flow of genetic information, okay? Which is essentially transcription in reverse, right? Transcription, DNA transcribed in RNA translated into protein. So think of that backwards. RNA into DNA because retroviruses comprise, contain RNA genetic material, okay? So they can reverse the flow of genetic information. Retroviruses have an RNA genome and that uh, can be copied into DNA where now the uh, host cell can basically uh, convert that DNA into, uh, or that RNA into DNA. Okay, so now we have viral DNA in uh, the genomes of, of li living organisms. And so we've, we've discussed the uh, technical, the technicalities of uh, retroviruses in the previous couple videos. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that when these various types of retrotransposons, if they move around in the genome for various functional roles, they can also induce genetic variation. Well, guess what? They leave the same signatures and they also require the integrase, the protease, the reverse transcriptase to do this. Okay. And so these signatures or scars or marks that we find throughout the genome, they are mostly there for internal reasons. There are many internal reasons that we've covered that would leave these exact same signatures. Someone like John is assuming that the reason why these signatures are there are due to external reasons, external factors, and he'd be wrong about that. So let's continue here. You find in the human genome, if you go back in time far enough, maybe you have to go back to like before we were even primates, but you would find a time where that specific endogenous retrovirus did not exist in the genome because it had not yet been inserted there. These things were inserted after evolution was already up and running. And this is all assumption after assumption, assertion after assertion. Okay. Because for the majority of these ERV and ERV-like sequences uh, directly in the conventional literature, in these technical papers, they admit that these occurred in the unobservable past they're not happening in real time and the ones that are shared between humans and chimpanzees are fixed they're stuck in place okay that means all humans have them all chimpanzees have them whether it's solo ltrs the thousands of those or the full ervs and they're functional they're necessary and so they are shared for the same reason why all types of modes of transportation have engines in common or steering wheels in common Okay, or batteries in common. It's good design. It's necessary. And if John Perry's going to argue against that, he's going to have to show us how these amazing functional roles, like viral mimicry, like the roles they play in the placenta and embryological development. Okay, I want to see how these can can evolve. And he has to answer the bigger question of the origin of retroviruses. And we're going to get into that soon. 
our ancestors were evolving. So number four, some ERVs can still produce full-fledged viruses when cells are stressed. So this is an obvious indication that ERVs really did come from viruses. This is a study on mice. In this paper, they, they witness a, a retrovirus get turned back on and start producing viral particles. In pigs as well, they've got some that will produce viral particles. In live pigs, the, the cells in live pigs are actually, they, they suppress viruses. The, the viruses aren't, aren't usually made. But if you do a cell culture of pigs, or if you have like an organ of a pig that you're keeping alive in a petri so as we're going to see here for point four, some ERVs can still produce full-fledged viruses when cells are stressed. Yes, this is a confirmed expectation and prediction of the escapee hypothesis, which many now in the evolutionary community are looking to for the origin of retroviruses. The reason why is because there's a paradox. What came first, retroviruses or the host? Because retroviruses require a host to replicate. So you can't have the retroviruses first. Because where's the host? Where's the cell? The cells, how are they going to replicate? And so the creation model has a very elegant explanation. And so these are not, these are not differentiating lines of evidence or reasons to say that, oh yeah, these ERVs really are the ancient remnants of past viral infections. Because this is exactly what we'd expect if retroviruses have originated from host genomes and host cells and host genes in general, okay? God front loads living organisms with all kinds of functional DNA units, okay? And this goes for these various classes of retrotransposons. You can look at lines, signs, the various types in there, okay? Because we have known functional roles for all of them. And then the ones that we may not know the exact function for they are situated within that 80% genomic activity that we know exists. And for many reasons, it's not spurious or noise. We've discussed that in the past. Now, because of mutations and errors in the packaging process or recombination environment, over time, harmful viruses escape the cell or there are errors in the packaging process. And before you know it, you got these full-fledged harmful viruses that can move around the genome, cause harm, cause disease, or cross species, where now it's in a whole new host, which is gonna cause even more harm and damage and disease because that host does not know how to regulate that virus. And so it burns hot and fast and causes a lot of damage. And this is the escapee hypothesis. So sure, ERVs can still produce full-fledged viruses when cells are stressed. Yes, when cells are stressed, okay, for internal reasons or external reasons, then that's when these harmful viruses can manifest in the body causing damage. These viruses are coming from healthy host genes or healthy host functional units of DNA like ERVs. Your pre-existing ERVs, they're the created ones. They're the functional ones. They're the ones that are shared, okay? There are unfixed ERV sequences in in humans but they're just located in in a subpopulation so those can be through true endogenization true events where exogenous retroviruses invade in the right way which would be in a reproductive cell they're passed on okay now we wouldn't expect those to have the kind of functional role that we see in these ERVs that are involved in embryological development, okay? So that's one way to uh, differentiate between created units of DNA function and ones that have come about after the fact, okay? So, so far he's not providing us anything that can really differentiate between the models because yes, the Cratius model, the escapee hypothesis, our version, my specific version in the biblical model of ancestry that I'm working on would say, since it solves this paradox, what came first, retrovirus or host? Well, the host, God front loads hosts with all kinds of functional units of DNA, including the ERVs. And from those genes over time, because of the fall, because of degeneration, because of deleterious mutation accumulation, we get harmful viruses. And after the fall is, is where and why 
in how cells can become stressed to the point where viruses are produced. This is another reason why exogenous retroviruses look like ERVs, especially the pre-existing functional and created ERVs, because those ERVs came first. And the exogenous retroviruses came from those genes, came from the host cell. And so they carry those similarities along with them. And as they cross species and move around the biological world in the animal kingdom, we, through further research, can actually trace each one back to its original host, to where it originated from created host genes. Very interesting research here. Okay, let's continue. Dish or something, it'll start to express viruses because it gets stressed. It can't, it can't stop those viruses from forming. So they do. Number five, populations. Exactly. These viruses are forming from pre-existing functional units of DNA and genes in these hosts. That's not telling us that these pre-existing ERVs that are shared between different biological organisms were once exogenous retroviruses because now they got to resort to storytelling. Okay, so you have an ancient primate ancestor that's infected with an exogenous retrovirus where you got somatic cells like my skin, skin cells would be somatic cells. So those mutations are not passed on. You have reproductive cells. If an exogenous retrovirus invades a germ cell and it's passed on, and then now every single cell of the DNA of the progeny is going to have that viral DNA. Well, from there, mutations over time are going to have to wipe out the harmful aspects of the endogenous retrovirus. And beneficial mutation accumulation is going to have to result in novel function or the host is going to have to uh, co-op certain parts of the ERV to act as promoters and, and function in many other ways. Okay. Then they have to drift to fixation because they're going to occur at low frequency. They're going to be harmful. They're going to be negative at first. They're not going to really serve a benefit. So natural selection should just weed out those new endogenous retroviruses over time. And they would be weeded out before they even acquire these novel functions because it's this process that's taking place. And then they can become fixed. They can go from low frequency to high frequency to where they're occurring at 100% frequency where everybody has these ERVs. This is storytelling. This is wishful thinking. That's why John Perry here hopes, dreams, and imagines that he's related to a banana plant, that he's related to a chimpanzee because of shared endogenous retroviral-like sequences. When in fact, the evidence is against him. And he needs to engage and interact with these points because so far the first four points fail, okay? ERV1, ERV protein genes match those of retroviruses, yes. ERV share sequence similarity with exogenous retroviruses, they have to in order to carry out many of their functional roles. One of them being viral mimicry where transcribed ERVs can actually give the sell the appearance of being invaded by a harmful retrovirus. And as, as a result, the immune system can target that cell with destruction. This is all mediated by the guardian of the genome, the P53, an incredibly designed protein. And what this can do is destroy tumor cells because tumor cells are good at invading detection by the immune system. But these transcribed ERVs, they're now giving those, those cells the appearance of being invaded. So now the immune system can destroy them. Well, guess what? This is viral mimicry. The ERV has to look like the virus to, to perform that role. And then if you got solo LTRs, because you're going to have some evolution and say, oh, but these units, they're, they're not preserved. They're not conserved by natural selection over time. So they must not be important or as important when they want to look to what they're assuming are degenerated ERVs like solo LTRs. But again, solo LTRs serve as binding sites for initiating or in, in, enhancing gene expression. They're important. They're functional stretches of DNA only assumed to be degenerated ERVs. 
And that's simply not the case. Okay. So one fails. Two, ERVs are bookended by long terminal repeats, just like retrovirus insertions. Yeah. Long terminal repeats, they are an, a, a component, a well designed component that works good in an ERV. And they also work good in the genomes of living organisms in isolation, where you just find them as solo LTRs. Okay. Because for the evolutionists to say that they're essentially degenerated ERVs, well, they're going to have to argue like they do in many circumstances for just the right set of events to incorporate an LTR from the ERV, okay? Because the ERV would have comprised it. And then insert it in the perfect position to serve as a promoter. That ends up changing the gene expression profile and benefits the host in, in the long run, in the long term, okay? And so this simply does not work because these functions associated with solo LTRs, they're widespread in the genome, okay? You know, you might be able to argue for one or two, but in terms of how many we find, it's just not, it's not feasible. It's very far-fetched, okay? And then he says, number three, retroviral integrase fingerprints are found before and after each ERV. These same fingerprints that we find all throughout the genome, okay, integrase fingerprints, these various signatures, they can occur and do occur for internal reasons. So that doesn't work. Four, <clears throat> some ERVs can still produce full-fledged viruses when cells are stressed. Yes, this is a confirmed prediction or expectation of the escapee hypothesis that uh, retroviruses, harmful viruses, have originated from host genes, host genomes. So number five, let's see here. Populations vary in number of ERVs, meaning they are continually inserted and deleted. No, what this means is, in the same way that we have incredibly designed DNA repair enzymes, Okay, because we get millions of DNA breaks and we pass on about 100 new mutations per person per generation. Okay, so even though we have these amazingly designed DNA repair enzymes that are constantly fixing DNA breaks in the cell, they don't do it perfectly. Doesn't mean that they don't exist. Doesn't mean that they're not designed. It's that some DNA breaks, some mutations, a mutation is basically an alteration in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. Okay. It's a typographical error, like you'd see in a text. And so many of these are fixed, but some are passed on. And so they're not completely prevented. And so we have front loaded, functional, well designed ERV and ERV like sequences. And one of the functional roles of these pre existing ERVs, and we're going to get into that soon are to fight off exogenous retroviral infection and subsequent endogenization of those harmful viruses. And so here's the thing, just like the DNA repair enzymes don't do their job perfectly, your pre-existing functional ERV units don't do their job perfectly. And so some exogenous retroviruses do make their way through. They manage to fight their way through into the next generation, into the kids, and become an endogenous retrovirus. And that's why populations vary in number of ERVs because you have some unfixed ones. And I've addressed that in my book here. Now, I've made predictions and they need to be addressed. So let's continue here. It's vary in number of ERVs, meaning they are continually inserted and deleted. So what I mean there is that if you look at any one species of animal, and then you look at different populations of that species, you will find that they have different numbers of ERV. Right, because you have fixed and unfixed. And so I would predict for the most part that, because there's always exceptions, of course, that if it's a full ERV, LTR, LTR, gag pole, ENV uh, components, then, and they're functional, okay, they're fixed. And so let's say all humans have them, all chimpanzees have them, they're shared. Well, they are shared due to design. They're created, okay? 
But if only a small population, a small subpopulation within the greater population has them, then they're true ERVs from exogenous retroviral infection in the germ cell lines and then passed on. <clears throat> in the same way that when it comes to design diversity or created heterozygosity that says God created Adam and Eve and the created kinds in a state of DNA diversity. I talk about this frequently for anybody new to this in basic genetics. It goes back to your alleles, right? Gene variants where you've got capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. You'd be genetically heterozygous in that instance. If you're capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B, you're genetically homogeneous or homozygous because there's no diversity there. It's the same. Okay. So God would have front loaded Adam, Eve, and the created kinds in a state of DNA diversity with pre existing heterozygosity. If you apply that understanding or concept, you have capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b, to millions of positions, genetic lo locations in the genome, you'd have unlimited potential for variation, especially through these processes, these uh, genetic processes like recombination, where pieces of DNA are basically broken and then recombined to produce new variations, new chromosomal combinations okay combinations of alleles because these alleles are pre-existing they're designed so the question is though how can we determine what is a designed allele or a design difference and what's a mutation well it's the same thing we would look to allele frequencies if it's common if it's a common allele it's functional it's beneficial it's not disease causing for the most part then it's probably created if it occurs at really low frequency, like blue eyes, for example, just occurs in a small subset of the population. And you can tell that this was a mutation that occurred probably after the Tower of Babel dispersal. Okay. So simply through allele frequencies, we see the same thing with ERVs. Okay. Ones that are not fixed, they occur at low frequency and even higher frequency too. Ones that are the very few that we find that are near fixed. Well, after uh, the flood, you'd have eight people, Noah, his wife, their three sons, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives. <clears throat> so you start from a small population, but there's been major shifts in environment. You go from this near perfect pre-flood world to a post-flood world that is now going to experience a lot more environmental harm a lot more environmental disasters. It's going to, uh, living organisms are gonna have more mutations, more degeneration, okay? And so the biological world is gonna be going downhill a lot more, including the environment, than in the pre-flood world due to these massive changes from the flood. And so for those first thousand years, you could have exogenous retroviral infection, subsequent endogenization, Okay. And then eventually people start spreading out after Babel, where they become isolated in different parts of the globe. Well, within that first, however many years, let's say 500 years or so, 300 to 500 years, you could have some of these endogenous retroviruses, true endogenous retroviruses, okay, drifting a little bit more. Not quite to fixation, but they may occur at higher frequency. Okay. And so I know this is getting technical. This is part of my, uh, active research research project here this is how we can build the best model because it's not just about countering the so-called best evidence for evolution it's also about providing a better model and the model that i am building is the biblical model of ancestry and we have an answer to this paradox that the evolutionists do any evolutionist listening right now quit dodging dodge duck dip dive and dodge the five d's of dodgeball they're great at it they're experts at it they got phds in it answer this question i want to see you make a video or make a written article, respond in a sophisticated manner. What is the true origin of retroviruses? Because retroviruses require a host to replicate. So what came first? Retroviruses are hosts. I don't want storytelling. I don't want imagination. So I know you guys are great at hoping, dreaming, and imagining. I want empirical evidence. Because the escapee hypothesis that I am putting forth and promoting has a lot of explanatory power. 
and provides very elegant explanations for what we see for these observations, including his number five reason why supposedly we know ERVs really come from viruses, that populations vary in the number of ERVs. This tells me that John Perry is behind in terms of being up to date on the latest evidence and research when it comes to ERVs. And so he's invited to respond and I'd like to see how he would engage or interact with these points. I do uh, appreciate this video. It's comprehensive. It's well edited. And not that it's challenging, but typically when you find ERV videos from these evolutionist websites, it's just the same thing over and over again. Very easy to debunk. Doesn't take much effort. But this, he's at least giving, you know, supposedly the best 11 reasons. And several of them here have motivated me to dig a lot deeper in not only refuting shared endogenous retroviral-like sequences in the biological world, but building a better model, okay? Because it's also about model building. I mean, most of them are identical. Most of them are shared, but, but sometimes you'll find like one or two ERVs. And he just refuted himself. Yes, most are shared. So whether it's your full ERVs or your thousands and thousands of solo LTRs that are shared, yes, we understand they're shared for common design reasons, okay? And they also fall out into nested hierarchical patterns where humans and chimpanzees are going to share more than humans and dogs or humans and an orangutan. Well, yeah, humans and chimpanzees look a lot more alike in terms of anatomy, morphology, physiology, and genetics than a human and a dog or a human and an orangutan. And so they would, if they're created units of DNA function, they're naturally going to fall out into nested hierarchical patterns. And so when you can demonstrate that, at least for your fixed functional ones, they are created units of DNA function, then as a result, you have a creatious explanation for both homologous patterns and nested hierarchical patterns because human engineers design and build things in both homologous and nested hierarchical patterns. And so why shouldn't God? But if they were all truly the result of ancient viral infections in past ancestors and they've been passed down throughout evolutionary history, then yes, it would be very difficult and challenging for us as biblical creationists to explain the nested hierarchical patterns. Okay, the patterns that these ERV and ERV-like sequences fall out into. Yeah, that'd be a little more challenging. But if they're created units of DNA function for the most part, then it's easy. The explanation arises naturally. In one population that are unique to that population and only found there, this is the... Right, unique to that population only found there of a greater population. Then yes, that can be through true endogenous retroviral infection. Yeah, 100% case in chickens. So here is a study where people took a bunch of different chicken breeds and analyzed their DNA and they found that uh, some of them had more ERVs than others. Well, they found one that had an, an extra ERV. And what that means... Sure. Again, sometimes the design mechanisms that are there, they're put in place to fight off exogenous retroviral infection, to fight off these exogenous retroviruses from being passed down to the next generation through the germ cell line and becoming an, an ERV or in the same way that these DNA repair enzymes act to fix these DNA breaks. Some DNA breaks or mutations still make their, their way through. Okay. But like he's saying, it's usually just one or two. It's, it's pretty easy for the most part. Again, there are some, Dr. Zach Hancock, he has a video that I'm going to be responding to after this one, I'm being comprehensive, where he shows some ERVs at, at a higher frequency. Okay. Well, for the most part, we have that explanation for after uh, the flood and prior to the, the Babel dispersal. Okay. You could have some ERVs that are true ERVs uh, drifting a little bit more to fixation before people spread out in all parts of the globe. Okay. So number five, so one, two, three, four, and five all fail miserably to say that all ERVs really are the ancient remnants of viral infection. So he's going to have to do a lot better than this. 
means is that either a an ERV was inserted in that population since humans started breeding chickens, or it means yes, one was inserted. Yeah, and we know that because it's unfixed. It's probably disease causing, probably harmful. Definitely not functional in the embryo. Definitely not functional in terms of absolutely requiring it to survive. Yes, some of these functional roles involved in like cell stress responses. Here's the thing. If your exogenous retroviruses have originated from host genomes, then they're obviously taking some of those pre-existing components and attributes or traits with them. And so sure, they might be able to manifest those previous traits as they infiltrate another species and they become an ERV. Okay. But when it comes to, and this is why the challenge is there, show me a non-functional ERV going from non-functional to something incredibly functional and embryological development. That's what I want to see. Is that that one ERV was somehow deleted in all other populations of chickens. And so in this case, because one pop ERVs could be deleted, but the more likely case, the most parsimonious reason for, again, just like in humans, there's one paper that I cite in my book here and talk about, there's unfixed ERVs. Again, it's the ones that are fixed and shared, more or less not disease causing. The reason why I say more or less is because over time, damage can happen, deleterious mutation accumulation can happen as muta mutations accumulate and hit ERV sequences that are not disease causing at the time and that deleterious mutation can result in a disease. So it's, we don't want to be too dogmatic. Okay. There's just many reasons or many ways that we can go about determining what is created and what is not, but there's also other factors at play. Okay. It's not one dimensional. It, it's sophisticated. That's why we require a sophisticated model, but we actually have the model because we can actually explain the bigger picture. And then from there, we can make hypotheses, we can come up with various explanations, make predictions, retrodictions, but the evolutionist is stuck at the starting line because they're stuck answering the origin of retroviruses in general. Population of chickens had it and all the other ones didn't. Obviously the most parsimonious conclusion is that this is a new insertion in that one Sure. Again, he used the same word, parsimonious. Sure. Not proving his point, though. This is another thing showing us that endogenous retroviruses really do come from viruses, because how would it have gotten? So he's not, I don't want to say he's not understanding the model. Maybe he's not aware of it, but it's more four dimensional than he's making it out. It's not like, well, either every single ERV is a result of exogenous retroviral infection in the ancient past. Or they're all created units of DNA function. No, the best explanation, the best model is the biblical explanation. The one that I provide and have been providing and building upon is that the majority of them, like your fixed functional ones are created, but over time, over the last 4,500 years since the flood, you can get true ERVs. But those are largely going to be unfixed occurring at lower frequencies in these populations you know they may manifest some of their pre-existing traits okay so i'm not saying it's absolutely impossible to manifest some pre-existing function or ability that it had maybe in the immune system okay but when it comes to embryological development or these functions that make it absolutely necessary where mammals, for example, literally can't survive without them. You know, this tells us that, yes, these are created. Th these are design expectations. An endogenous retrovirus, if it didn't come from a retrovirus, koalas are just loaded with ERVs and any individual might have way more ERVs than another one. Any family line, I should say. Because they have the viruses that, that are giving them these new ERVs, they're highly active. They actually make koalas sick and they get each other sick. And these things just are really good at inserting themselves in the germ lines. So they're good at getting into sperm or egg or, you know, newly fertilized fetuses, which makes it so they end up getting in the germ line. 
and they're passed from parent to child. And this is happening in koalas right now. In humans, it so there's a good one. I talked about it for a little bit in, in my previous show, but with the koalas, this is another confirmed expectation of everything I've been saying here. Okay. Because again, these ERVs act as antiviral protectors and they act as an antiviral system in these genomes. Okay. And so one of the mechanisms that I've described involves the disruption of endogenous retroviruses. This is what we see in the koalas today. This is what has been identified. And he just showed a paper there describing this, okay? And so the koala endogenous retroviruses, K-O-R-V, I think, if I remember correctly, they can undergo retrotransposition. And so if you have an active retroviral infection, there is a high likelihood that reverse transcription will take place to allow the retroviral material to proliferate throughout the genome. And so one way to actually disrupt the retroviral infection is to disrupt the endogenization process. This is thinking ahead. This is forward thinking. This is good, good design and good planning, okay? And it turns out <clears throat> that these pre-existing ERVs in the koalas, the ones that I'm saying are created, designed, they're functional, they're the ones disrupting this process. This is amazing. This is fascinating. It truly is. Okay. And John here, and I appreciate his points and I would appreciate his engagement. Okay. Because currently ERVs provide some of the best evidence for the biblical creationist and not the evolutionist because the evolutionist is not being diligent in defending their points here. Like we're seeing here with the first five. Okay, so these pre existing koala ERVs, they disrupt this process and they will insert into the freshly transposed elements that is part of the active infection. This is amazing stuff. And this actually disrupts or stops, it basically destroys the endogenization process. And this infectious process activates the pre existing koala ERVs to now function. So they have the pre existing function. What's going on here? This process, this negative, harmful process, is actually activating these pre existing, these functional and created koala ERVs to now fight off these invaders and disruptors and do their job as antiviral protectors. OK, and so in a nutshell, the viral endogenization process is being stopped to, to basically continue. It's being completely disrupted through the means of the koala ERVs. And this is a way to fight fire with fire. This is great stuff here. Right here, he's showing in humans. Yes, certain family of unfixed ERVs. Yeah, still not answering or providing us with discriminatory lines of evidence because that's the whole point. To model build, you're going to have to look at the fixed. You're going to have to look at the unfixed. You're going to have to look at the varying frequencies that these occur in. You're going to have to look at the functions, which one are, ones are disease causing, which ones are not disease causing. Okay, what kind of functions are we looking at? Are they essential functions? or functions that, that are important, but not necessarily essential. There's a lot here. It's, it's very sophisticated. It's four-dimensional. And a lot of these evolutionists simply don't understand that, unfortunately. It is not happening right now, so far as we can tell, but it was happening until fairly recently, probably somewhere around six to 10,000 years ago. Uh, we still had Okay, so we're doing good. This is part three, and we just hit 1530. And these are some technical points, and so they require some technical rebuttals. So I do want to stop it there, go over some slides, and we're going to wrap it up. And hopefully you'll be excited for part four, because we're taking this whole video apart, point by point, line by line, argument by argument. And then I want to get into Dr. Zach Hancock's video next. And he's someone, a PhD on the evolutionist side that, that I do respect. He has a, a lot of knowledge. He puts in the work to engage. 
and to interact. And so, in my opinion, that makes him deserving of my engagement and interaction as well. Okay. So, all right, let's have a look at this. And then we'll start to wrap that up, wrap this up. Let's go full screen, make it easier for you guys. So this is just a slide here that I have. I was talking about this earlier with these target site duplications. Well, notice this. However, several TEs, that's transposable elements, still are active in other organisms. <clears throat> we can say transposons and transposition are one of the evolutionary forces in which the target site duplication plays an important role. We can say the process of TSD, target site duplication, induces new variation in nature. In other words, just through internal mobility of a lot of these T's. And here's the thing, over the last 4,500 years, we have, I mean, ERVs alone make up 8% of the genome, 40% so-called viral DNA. So you have all these classes of retrotransposers. You got the signs, the lines, you got all these various DNA units, okay? And a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them can move around. Maybe some of them have lost the ability to mobilize over the last 4,500 years, but that's thousands of years, or even just consider the first thousand years after the flood, where you've got these functional DNA units, these mobile genetic elements, moving around through retrotransposition, leaving behind these signatures, these marks, these scars, all due to internal reasons, not external. But then the evolutionist comes along and assumes that these marks are there, for external reasons. They're wrong. They're very wrong. <clears throat> Notice this. Uh, I wanted to show it actually from the, right here. So from the conventional literature, where did viruses originate from? So this has a basis in the secular literature. Evolutionary scientists are even hypothesizing this because they understand this, this, this issue, this challenge. Contemplating the origins of life fascinates both scientists and the general public. Understanding the evolutionary history of viruses may shed some light on this interesting topic. To date, no clear explanation for the origin or origins of viruses exists. So they're admitting this. Viruses may have arisen from mobile genetic elements that gain the ability to move between cells. Now remember, the, the biblical creation, specifically me, at least in terms of my model, we have the majority of these mobile genetic elements, these various classes of retrotransposons, they're front loaded at the beginning. They're created for many of the reasons that I've described. And so viruses may have arisen from genetic mobile elements. Well, exactly. That would explain or answer this challenge. What came first, the retrovirus or the host, the host, but the host was designed with functional units of DNA, designed with high levels of heterozygosity. And from there, after the fall, due to degeneration, environment, so on and so forth, you get these viruses arising from pre existing genes, from created genes, and from created DNA units like genetic mobile elements. Okay. And so very interesting here, viruses from cells, right? You got God creates cells, creates biological organisms. And from there, from these pre-existing genes and DNA units, you get these viruses. And then from there, you have some very solid explanations for a lot of the observations that, that we see. Notice this, this process very closely mirrors the movement of an important, though somewhat unusual component of most eukaryotic genomes, retrotransposons. These mobile genetic elements make up an astonishing 42% of the human genome. So no wonder why these evolutionists can look to various scars or signatures and say, see, this is evidence of external infection. No, if these mobile genetic elements, a massive portion of the genome comprising them, have moved around for the last few thousand years, okay, and maybe they moved around a lot more after the flood, and of course they're going to leave behind these marks, and many of them, but for internal reasons, and can move within the genome via an RNA intermediate. 
remember where retroviruses can reverse the flow of genetic information, like we said before, okay? Like retroviruses, certain classes of retrotransposons, the viral-like retrotransposons, encode a reverse transcriptase and often an integrase. So John Perry was saying, oh, you know, the fact that they even encode these enzymes and the fact that they're built this way, they look this way, they have these traits, must mean that they're due to ancient retroviral infections. But in fact, no, they require this makeup. They require these enzymes to even carry out their functional roles, one of them being retrotransposition. With these enzymes, these elements can be transcribed into RNA, reverse transcribed into DNA, and then integrated into a new location within the genome. And when they, when they do that, they're going to leave behind a mark, but it's due to internal reasons. We can speculate that the acquisition of a few structural proteins could allow the element to exit a cell. Notice this. They exit a cell and enter a new cell, thereby becoming an infectious agent. So they didn't start off infectious. They became infectious through processes taking place in, in the genomes of living organisms. They exit a cell and enter a new cell, and then they can even enter the cell of a new host if they cross species. Okay. Notice this. Indeed, the genetic uh, structures of retroviruses and viral-like retrotransposons show remarkable similarities, not because of evolution, not because they are the ancient remnants of past viral infections. No, because they have originated from healthy host genes. Notice this, escapees. And you'll notice that the sources, none of these are creationist sources. This is us taking various ideas. This is me taking various ideas from the conventional literature, <clears throat> looking at it from a biblical lens, the, the correct lens, the correct worldview, and realizing, wow, the biblical model can make sense of that which the evolutionary model struggles to explain. They're onto something here with the escapee hypothesis, but they can't make the ultimate conclusions because they have an incorrect starting point. They have erroneous presuppositions. They're making false assumptions. But when you have the biblical starting point, then everything becomes clear. That's why it's very important to have your biblical glasses on. Okay, folks? Viruses might have come from broken pieces of genetic material inside early cells. <clears throat> they want to throw in earlier primitive cells. Okay, just think cells. Cells that God designed. Okay, these one single cell more complex than the space shuttle. We have 100 trillion cells, 50, 60 trillion cells, whatever the number they're throwing out these days, okay? Every single one of them incredibly complex. These pieces were able to escape their original organism. That's what I've been saying. And in fact, another cell. In this way, they evolved into viruses. They want to use the, the word evolve. Modern day retroviruses like the HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, work in the same way. After they enter a cell, they combine their genetic material with the host genetic material. <clears throat> this is fascinating, guys. Confirmation of the uh, biblical model. And so I think we're going to wrap it up there because as you can see, I do have quite a few more slides on this. But... These are going to be relevant for his next five points as well. We've hit five. So now we got to hit his next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And most of the other ones, if I remember correctly, are going to have an explanation from what I'm talking about here, the escapee hypothesis. So we'll dig a little deeper. Plus, we might get some objections or challenges in the comment section of this video. And from there, I can uh, refute those or engage them. But I will read this. Notice this from this uh, paper on the origins of viruses, if I remember correctly. Right here, viral evolution, primordial cellular origins and late adaptation to parasitism. A third prevalent hypothesis. This is the evolutionary spin on it. The biblical understanding of the escapee hypothesis is the correct one and gives us the best foundation to building a successful model. The escapee hypothesis suggests that viruses were once part of the genetic material of host cells, but escaped cell control and later evolved by pickpocketing genes via horizontal gene transfer. Point is, these viruses came from hosts. Hosts predated them 
and pre-existing created units of DNA like ERVs also predated them. So guys, I think we covered a lot. I think we touched a lot of ground and we did just about an hour. So this specific part of this series, part three here, was I knew it would be a little more challenging because we're getting into the bigger picture, the origin of retroviruses. We've already engaged as first three points. Now we're really getting into heavy stuff. Not that the first few points aren't heavy, but they're just a lot easier or quicker to address. Now we're really getting into foundational uh, truths here, worldview truths when it comes to the origin of retroviruses. And a lot of this information that I'm providing you is novel. Novel in many ways, because I don't think you'll find really anyone else for the most part talking about this on YouTube in detail. Okay. And I do want to share a screen here real quick because there is a series of articles put out where another creationist has suggested this. And so notice this, and I'm doing my best to build upon it. So this is going back a little while ago, but Pierre Horberg, he says, RNA viruses have emerged from, so he calls them variation inducing genetic elements. Um, is Vige, is that the best term for it? Well, I like created units of DNA function because there's many functional roles. One of them is inducing variation, okay? <laughs> but they have so many, every year, I mean, there's there's a paper here that I was going over and I've gone over many times. Notice this, increasing knowledge, 2021. Our knowledge about endogenous retroviral elements involved in cell immune responses is, cons is constantly increasing. And so we're just learning. We're in the infancy of understanding the DNA language, guys. It's an amazing time to be a biblical creationist. So he says ERVs, lines, long interspersed nuclear elements, and signs that short interspersed nuclear elements are the genetic ancestors of RNA viruses. Darwinists are wrong in promoting ERVs as, as remnants of invasions of RNA viruses. It is the other way around. I agree with that. They have it backwards. You have ERVs that were front-loaded and created at the beginning. They were front-loaded into living organisms, and they're functional in many ways. But after that, we, through a series of events, various processes, especially after the flood, okay, you have the origin of harmful viruses. Remember, you have more viruses in and on your body than you do bacteria and cells, if I remember correctly, even cells. And you have a lot of bacteria. And so it turns out <clears throat> that your trillions and trillions of viruses are actually regulating the amount of bacteria that you have. Because we understand bacteria is good. Bacteria is healthy and necessary. You wouldn't want to live on a planet or a world without bacteria and without viruses. And so the majority of bacteria, the majority of viruses are good, healthy, and beneficial. All right. It's only a, a small subset of them that are actually harmful. And this is because we live in a fallen, a, a world that's going downhill. And this has all occurred and originated the harmful bacteria, harmful viruses due to degeneration after the fall. OK, and that's why when you have the biblical lens, you can explain this data and you can build the best model possible. And so with that, guys, in fear that I'll continue uh, talking about this subject. We are a little bit over an hour, so I'm going to wrap it up and save uh, even more for the last 10 minutes. So we've gotten through just over 15 minutes of this video. And so I, if I had to guess right now, we'll probably finish the response in, uh, we could try and do it in the next video and make it a four-part series, but I'm suspecting we'll probably need two more. Okay. So with that, guys, uh, thank you for tuning in. Share around this content. God bless you. Just remember, the truth is important. God bless all.